I'm a neurobiologist, so I'm not a clinician. And uh, what I'd like to do with you on the next 20 minutes is to take you to some of the work that we have been doing in the lab on the molecular, at the molecular level, on the interplay between uh, neuro and immune systems. And by neuro system, I mostly mean the synaptic uh, transmission, synaptic organization. So, uh, thanks to our, the previous uh, speakers, and in particular, Yoda Schoenfeld that gave a, an amazing uh, introduction about autoimmunity. You know that autoimmunity is everything, and everything is, is uh, relative, as it said. So, based on this uh, introduction, I will be rather fast on my first two slides, in which uh, I, I guess I don't have to convince you on the, the role of the immune and brain interactions in the appearance of uh, psychiatric disorders, in particular in the case that I will discuss this morning on the psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia. And you know this very well model or view that uh, overdevelopment, you have either genetic vulnerability, and you have several eats that can actually come from the immune systems that will basically lead to dysfunction, a disbalance of uh, many systems in our body and in our brain, of course. And autoimmunity is among those uh, uh, immune dysregulations that can actually trigger brain disbalance between several uh, main functions. So autoimmunity in the brain, as uh, Yoda uh, Schoenfeld said this morning, I mean, there has been many autoantibodies that has been uh, fine over the past years, actually starting almost a century ago, uh, with uh, target that can be inside the cells, target that can be uh, at the surface of uh, cells, and particularly neurons, in which uh, you have uh, some uh, receptors, metabotropic glutamate receptors, dopamine receptors, acetylcholine receptors, inotropic receptors, so on. And if you just look at in schizophrenia, for instance, if you just glance through the literature, you will find, as you can see here, you can, you can spot many different targets. So obviously, there's been a lot of uh, debate in the field about uh, the molecular pathogenicity of these antibodies, whether they can actually cross the blood-brain barriers, whether they actually can reproduce by themselves animal model in which you mimic uh, some of the symptoms of patients, and whether actually those uh, antibodies, if present in the same patient, can actually cooperate or act as a synergic way. And obviously whether, which is one of the key and, and outcome of those work, whether an immunotherapy can actually be beneficial for this patient. So obviously I will not going to address all of those key questions, which I'm sure will keep us uh, quite busy for the next uh, years or even decades, but I will basically f focus on specific autoantibody, uh, which basically target this glutamate an MDA receptor, uh, which is a receptor fine in the glutamate synapse, you know, 80% of your connection in the brain are glutamatergic. And this receptor has been really the center of attention for the last uh, two or three decades because it plays a major role in the maturation of the glutamate synapse and the plasticity of the glutamate synapses. And not that surprisingly, in a way, uh, a dysfunction of this NMD receptor has been found to be related to neurological and psychotic disorders, in which in particular uh, the, the prominent dysfunction of the receptor has been one of the core hypotheses in schizophrenia and psychotic disorders with the so-called hypofunction of the receptor that has been uh, reproduced using a specific antagonist uh, to several symptoms in, in patients. So, the question that we, we wanted to tackle uh, when we started this, this journey together with uh, Marion Way a couple of years ago was to actually test the role of this, the autoantibodies directed against an MD receptor and that was, uh, as also alluded earlier this morning, first uh, find in, uh, in lupus and then later in anti MD receptor encephalitis. Uh, uh, discovered by Josep Dalmo, was found to, to be strongly related to uh, psychotic features in those, in those patients. So the question was whether you find similar autoantibodies in, in uh, psychotic patients, in, in particular in schizophrenic patients. And if yes, uh, do these autoantibodies have a molecular pathogenicity? 
And there's been a lot of work, um, a lot of debate, and I will just elude at the end of the talk, just with one slide, that uh, both at the level of detections and the level of impact of those antibodies, uh, we believe that today uh, a, a new or innovative approach to really look at uh, the, the way we can detect these particles and the way we can really measure the pathogenicity will be key for the future. So the way we did it was to uh, look uh, in the circulation of uh, either LC uh, individuals or, or uh, patients with uh, schizophrenia. And so we used classical cell-based assay to actually pinpoint that uh, about less than 20% of the patients in this case were seropositive for the autoantibody against the NMD receptor. And we found few, and you will see it was rather important, a few healthy uh, seropositive uh, subjects without any history of either neurological or psychiatric disorders. The titer were pretty similar between these two groups, way lower than what you can find, for instance, in encephalitis uh, patients. So clearly you have less of these antibodies compared to uh, specific inflammation as in encephalitis. If you label a wild-type tissue in animals with this, you have this kind of specific staining that you can find in hippocampus. If you use a knockdown animal in which gland 1 subunit, which is the supposed target of this antibody, then basically the staining is gone, uh, indicating that among the IgG that were purified from these patients, uh, the only uh, target that could, find in, that could be fine to the brain was against the NMD receptor. And what we, we did as a kind of, uh, I would say, uh, most obvious experiments to test whether those antibodies, autoantibodies, are actually blocker, antagonist of the NMD receptor. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, the, the hypofunction of the NMD receptor is really based on the effect of PCP, ketamine, and, and many other, other blockers. And to make long story short, just here an example, if you look in, specifically in synapses, and you look with the calcium transient that recirculate through the NMD receptor, in neurons that are exposed to either the LC, uh, LCRGD or the one from the patient, basically you find no change whatsoever in the, uh, in the calcium that flux through the NMD receptor. If you get single channel level and you pour IgGs uh, with high concentration, you don't change at all uh, the activation of the receptor. So as we thought ourselves, and as many of our colleagues said, that if NMD receptor are not antagonists of the NMD receptor, really, who cares? I mean, what, what the hell are you losing your time looking at those autoantibodies? We, we lost our time and, and maybe we shed kind of new lights on, on the way it can work is because to have an NMD receptor signaling, which is absolutely very important for synapses, you first need to have, of course, a receptor that can be activated, but on top, and keep that in mind, you need to have a receptor that is placed in the synapse where it should work. So if you have a receptor that is far away from the synapse, it can be activable, but it will not be activated by glutamate into the synapse. And I'm not going to through that, but as you can see, I mean, the journey of receptor to reach a synapse is rather adventurous and kind of complicated. So we basically focus on what happens when the receptor is in the plasma membrane and when it can actually be reaching or leaving the glutamate synapses. I'm not going to enter into the detail. We basically use uh, several approaches, in particular the single molecule approach that was awarded the Nobel Prize for three, uh, three amazing scientists uh, three years ago uh, because that clearly revolutionized uh, most of the biological field. And what, what this technique allows you to do is to really point in a living brain tissue uh, where the real receptor, protein, phospholipid of interest is located with unprecedented uh, accuracy. And a typical type of, uh, of recording that you can get if here you imagine that in the dark you have a uh, hippocampal network with neuron, astrocyte and microglia and each of the little white dots that you see here is a, is a single receptor. This is not accelerated, so this is a 30 hertz acquisition, so this is basically what is actually occurring in your brain right now. You see that basically it moves, which, which was known since 20 years now, and that receptor 
spend a few uh, tens of second minutes in the synapse and then get, uh, get away, and another receptor come in, etc., etc. So you have this constant, uh, uh, constant movement and dynamics of receptor at the surface of neurons, and thanks to that, you can actually change the receptor, replenish those pools, and actually adapt. So based on these approaches, we basically wanted to, to, to look at what, what is actually controlling that. And I'm not going to enter detail, but just I want to point here that we, uh, we pinpoint over the last uh, 10 years or so many, many regulators. So actually more we dig, less I understand, which may be a good sign. Uh, because you can see that the regulation of the fast dynamic and the retention of an NMB receptor is regulated by several intracellular regulators, transmembrane regulators, interaction between receptors. Just like, for instance, between an NMB receptor and dopamine receptor, you have this direct interaction in the plasma membrane. And if you just ch change that, you will instantaneously redistribute both receptors. And we find good evidence as well that uh, extracellular regulators, coagonists, agonists, whatever, uh, tissue plasminogen, are, are strong regulators of the dynamic of the receptor. And kind of more uh, interestingly for, I would say, functional point of view, we actually find that if you prevent specifically uh, the fast dynamic or, or the fast redistribution of a given subtype of the NMD receptor, you actually completely prevent uh, the long-term potentiation of glutamate synapse, which is one of the features for the plasticity of the synapse that can be actually triggered by synaptic activity or we actually also test that uh, using a stress hormone or sexual hormones. And not surprisingly, if you impair that just by freezing the receptor, leaving their inotropic function absolutely intact, then you also obviously impact and then your receptor dependent function such as uh, associative memories. So the question was pretty simple, what are the autoantibodies auto doing on the dynamic of the NMD receptor? And uh, to go right to the point, what you see here on the top is a synapse label here uh, with this uh, white zone and you have a single NMD receptor. Uh, as, as usually, he likes to dwell for some time, he spent there, he most likely transmits some information and it goes, go outside and go inside. If you expose neurons about 10 minutes with the autoantibody from schizophrenic patients, we observe something that was exactly reminiscent from what we previously find with uh, autoantibodies from encephalitis patient, which is that the NMD receptor is just gone and lost. It's there, it's still at the membrane, it still can be activated, but it's just not sitting there, it's just like, I don't know, iron, and just going, going all around, around synapse and outside synapses. And this is what we kind of quantify, obviously, uh, looking at, uh, at the time that the receptor can spend to the synapse. And again, to make long story short, what we found was that IgG from LC individuals, although they bind the NMD receptor, and the, 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 the clearly labeled receptor, the surface, they had no effect on the behavior of the receptor. The receptor could stay into the synapse and dwell as it will. While if you expose the neurons with the IgG from the psychotic patients, then you had the major redistributions almost instantaneously where the receptor could actually move into all directions. We actually use a trick to uh, dampen and to really reduce the content of the IgGs into, uh, into the preparations, expressing the NMD receptor from metrologous cells. And if you do that, you actually prevent this fast uh, disorganization of the NMD receptor, suggesting again that uh, it's specifically the antibody against the NMD receptor that is required for this effect. I'm not to enter into the detail of the mechanisms. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, we, we did kind of dig into those mechanisms, starting first with antibodies against uh, the NMU receptor from encephalitis patients. But to make long story short, what we kind of uh, uh, unveil is that to, in order to stabilize an NMU receptor, the plasma membrane, you need, as I show earlier, a couple of mechanisms. And in one in particular, which is the interaction between these two receptors. It's really like two tango dancers. They are interacting directly. And you can actually modulate that, uh, favoring the activation of the efferin receptors, which will stabilize the complex with the NMD receptor. 
And what the autoantibody is doing as kind of steric endurance is that it binds a specific uh, a domain of the gluon 1 subunit on the extracellular domain. And by doing that, you, you prevent interaction with a scaffold partner in a way. And by doing that, you actually redistribute both the NMD receptor that leave the synapse and the FN receptor that also leave the synapse. So in a way, the couple is, is, is disrupted and both receptors are gone. Does it, does it produce the kind of NMD receptor dependent dysregulation that we can think of? And the answer is yes. And I'll just show you an example here. If you induce plasticity into epicampal synapses, both in vitro and in vivo, and in this case, for instance, you inject uh, either the Ig from the LC uh, as seropositive uh, uh, donors or from the patients, and you induce what is called long-term potentiation, so you, 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 you trigger the synapse, you challenge the synapse in a way that its transmission is increased. In the presence of either uh, just uh, LC, IgG, without any uh, uh, autoantibody against an ND receptor, or with the LC seropositive, basically, as you can see, you have no alteration of the plastic range. Uh, however, if you um, expose this hippocampus just for a few hours, and it's not chronic, just for a few hours, you first not only block the long-term potentiation, so the plasticity, but you actually reverse it. And that's something that we find in every every animal that were tested, which is pretty striking, and I have no clue what, what this kind of process can actually be, but you actually induce an LTD. So you see that to have, uh, to have either one or the other is not only changing that the receptor is not any more placed into the synapse, but on top, the plastic range of the synapse is actually shifted. Um, we actually look in other uh, uh, patients, seropositive patients, and I'll just show you an example. Uh, from uh, uh, seropositive patients from a first episode psychosis patient cohort uh, that was under from the optimized project. And what we find for, uh, with uh, the antibody from those patients is basically what I, I just showed you before, in a way that the incubation of uh, neurons with those uh, antibodies against the NMU receptor produce the same kind of disorganization of the, of the NMU receptor. We also uh, found uh, a seropositive uh, patient with an autism spectrum disorder and with no history of psychosis in particular. So we actually purified this and exposed it exactly in the same way. And as you can see here, in this case, as long as we can let, as high a titer as we can try, uh, there was absolutely no dysregulation of the NMD receptor that was actually pretty, pretty happy with uh, the presence of these antibodies. So, I mentioned earlier that uh, there's been clearly uh, discussions and still will be uh, in the field about uh, whether you first you find seropositive patients, which obviously is also important as a clinical point of view. And so to, to try to, to uh, contribute and shed lights into this debate, uh, we, we kind of made a, a European uh, uh, effort in a way that from uh, this first uh, episode of psychosis patients, uh, we uh, selected the one that were seropositive and we asked uh, several labs in Europe using different tests to actually uh, give the outcome in terms of detections as it is done daily in those services. And uh, kind of uh, surprisingly, or maybe not that surprisingly, we find a very heterogeneous outcome. Depending on the method used, either to make it short, either you use live cells to detect the receptor or fixed cells or different type of, of uh, methods to actually bind and label the, the, the cells, we found very different things from, from almost 100 to 200% variations. So clearly indicating that today, um, the methods that are used are very uh, providing absolutely a perfect outcome in terms of detection in encephalitis, for instance, or in pathology in which you have a strong titer of the autoantibodies, while here in those, in those uh, uh, pathologies, you can see that the low titer is probably uh, reaching the limit of the SA. So we actually try to, to boost right now and to really find a way to use other approach with single molecule that is not sensitive to the concentration to actually tackle that. So the take home message, uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, using single molecule to really go down to the level of a single receptor. Uh, we first could confirm that you find autoantibody against an receptor in a fraction of schizophrenic patients, in a fraction, to about 20%. Um, those antibodies, but not the one from else individuals, 
had a molecular pathogenicity in a way that they displaced the NMDA receptor from the synapse, sterically, you don't change the channel, you don't change the activity of the receptor, you just push it away. And obviously, you impair all of the NMDA receptor dependent function of the synapse. Quite, uh, quite interestingly, this means that NMDA receptor antibodies are heterogeneous in their ability to disrupt or to uh, impair that, which, which is clearly a caution when using those uh, antibodies as a biomarker. I may be seropositive, or you may have antibodies that will not perturb the, uh, the receptor, which is a challenge for us because it's not only that you need to detect the autoantibody, but on top, you need to verify that this antibody has the potential to, to, make, uh, to change the NMDA receptor. And obviously, the challenge is, is to have a, a very uh, uh, I would say relevant and, and reliable assay to uh, pinpoint uh, and to really detect those antibodies in patients who offer adapted uh, function. And just to, 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 f to finish, just two points that uh, we find similar alteration of the NMD receptor, but for sake of time, obviously, I, I could not just talk about it either in developmental model or even from CSF, uh, from schizophrenic patients. So we don't believe that this is just specific or just like a, a specific alteration due to the autoantibodies, but uh, cytokines or other molecules can actually produce exactly the same phenotype. So I'd like to finish and, and to, to, uh, to mostly thanks all of our collaborators that uh, made this, this project possible, in particular Marion and Riyad over the, over the years, Jérôme Laurent, Josep, and, and many other uh, collaborators that really uh, help us to push uh, further. Thank you very much.